thank you very much, John. And uh, thank you very much to Waltham. Uh, this is my first wins, so I don't have to worry about what the plural of a wins is. This is the one. Um, but it's very enjoyable. I've enjoyed meeting a number of you already. And uh, unfortunately, I have to leave fairly promptly after this, I'm afraid. So this is your chance. If you have questions, please feel free to ask them of me. So um, how do I change the slides, actually? I didn't ask that. <laughs> do I have a thing here? Yes, I do. Yes, that's going to do it, I think. Right. OK, um, so I'm going to talk. The title I took was the three R's, Research in an Ethical Context. Um, and as I go through my talk, I'm going to bring out what are the scientific and economic benefits of implementing the three R's. But alongside those are the social and ethical gains. I think we always think about the three R's from an ethical perspective, but there are much, there's much more to it than that. And I hope that's what I can bring out in what I'm going to share with you today. Um, as uh, John has said, I'm from the UK. I'm a vet, like many of you in the audience here. Um, and I have the pleasure, the honor of being invited by the UK government after I retired earlier this year to continue with the work that I've been doing, uh, a program of work on international implementation of the three R's. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well towards the end of my talk. So in summary then, a little bit of history on research regulation and the three R's, some examples of science-led three R's approaches. And I'm going to include in there what I sometimes term the fourth R, which is about reproducibility, uh, a little bit about international progress, and then I'm going to finish with some concluding principles, okay? Right, let's think about the ethical background then. And um, we don't have, we, we can't boast everything in terms of Western ethics around animal welfare. And if we go back to the period of René Descartes here, you'll see that actually at that time, there was very limited understanding of what we mean by animal welfare. Uh, Descartes and the Cartesian philosophy is basically that only humans have minds, have souls, and have consciousness. And therefore, only humans can feel pain, and animals are unable to feel pain. So this is a kind of background where, whereby vivisection was being widely practiced in Europe, um, and without any anesthesia, because of course at this stage anesthesia had not yet been developed. So it's rather grotesque to think about some of the things that may have taken place during that, ethical, that period from an ethical perspective. About 150 years later, this gentleman, Jeremy Bentham, made the, I think, very profound and well-recognized statement about animals, because the argument was whether animals had the ability to reason, whether they had mind, souls, and the ability to reason. And he said, the question is not can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? Uh, and that's what leads us to the utilitarian approach to ethics, which is balancing the harms we may cause to animals against the benefits that we can accrue from those harms. Um, minimizing the harms, therefore, maximizing benefits, so that in this uh, cost-benefit, harm-benefit analysis, we can try to get some sort of measure of what should be authorized, should be permitted, and what should not. And clearly within this, there is a permission for animals to suffer for the benefit of humankind, or indeed for the benefit of other animal kind, but it's about getting this balance right, and, and that's called the utilitarian balance. Now, moving on forward then to 1876, um, this was a pivotal year for research animal welfare. And I, I've put this, these two pictures up here because um, we've actually been doing a little bit of work on the history of research animal regulation in the UK this year because it's 140 years of regulated animal research. The very first regulations for animal research were, carried, were uh, implemented in 1876 and you'll see there on the left-hand side is the front cover of, and, and a rather tatty front cover, I'm afraid now, but that's a Royal Commission report of 1876 that then led to the act that is on the right-hand side, the 1876 Cruelty to Animals Act that regulated the use of animals in research, first time in the world that there was any regulation of this. Going forward from there then, we see, and I think this is rather nice, again, a document that we pulled out of the archives for part, as part of our celebrating the 140 years. Handwritten list here um, from 1898 of people who wish to use dogs. 
And there's some very famous physiologists included in that handwritten list there. Um, it's such a difference from nowadays where everything's on spreadsheets and so on. Um, and there's one written by the hand of an inspector. And what's rather nice is that you can see there under uh, Dr. Hock, Dr. Hick, I've got a pointer here somewhere, I think, haven't I? Um, halfway down there, that the removal of uterus on ovaries, 20 days, and it says he asked for 30, 20 dogs, sorry, sorry, and then it says he asked for 30. So not all requests were granted, but there are some kind of pr procedures there that because of the implementation of the three R's and ways of replacing the use of animals and finding alternatives to animals, we would not actually nowadays be authorizing. So the world has moved on a great deal. The other area in which the world has moved on somewhat is in terms of openness and transparency. And I think many of you in this room are probably either familiar with or, or associate animal research with threats from extremism and so on like that. Well, here we have, in 1922, a list of all of the scientists who've been authorized to carry out work on animals. And that was published in the 1922 annual report in the UK. So there's quite a significant difference there. What's now happening is the clock's turning round a little bit. And what we're finding in the UK now is that scientists are becoming much more open about the research that they're doing using animals. And as a consequence of that, the public is actually becoming much more comfortable with it. So we're moving away from the secrecy piece, much more back towards openness and transparency, rather akin to what we see in 1922. So history is being made. Here's that page again, and I've identified there, highlighted the name of um, Alexander Fleming. And he asks to use animals, which figure in eventually his Royal Society paper, which coins the term lysozyme. So here we can see how history is being made by these individuals who are working with animals in research. So fast forward the clock now through to 1959, and the concept of the three R's is born in a, a publication sponsored by the University's Federation for Animal Welfare, entitled The Principles of Humane Experimental Technique. Introduce the concept of the three R's, replacement, reduction, and refinement. And it's really about, written by these two fine gentlemen, William Russell and Rex Birch, who sadly both are now dead, um, but it's about minimizing the harms that we cause to animals within an ethical context. So let's look a little bit more about what do we mean by the three R's and then explore those. So <clears throat> my argument for you is that the three R's provides a sound framework for using animals in research. And wherever I go in the world, it's really hard to argue against the, the sense, the logic that goes with these three principles of the three R's. It's amazing to me, actually, that it took a long time from 1959 for the three R's to really catch on. But let's first of all just make sure we all understand what we mean by them. So replacement is using totally non-animal methods, for example, in silico, or increasingly we can use human data, data from human clinical patients, or indeed in your field, it could be the, that it's data from veterinary patients as opposed to veterinary research animals. That's absolute replacement. And then also replacement is using cells or tissues or organs that have been derived from animals and are used in vitro. So that's relative replacement. So all of that bundles up into what we would call replacement. Reduction is using fewer animals, often through good experimental design. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And it could be about obtaining the same information from fewer animals or more information from the same number of animals. It's not necessarily about minimizing to an absolute, as low as you can, number of animals, because it is important to ensure that the experiments have been well designed so you get sound and reliable data from those experiments. So reduction is not about reducing as low down as you can possibly get, but about reducing to the right number of animals to be used. And refinement is about using methods which minimize pain or distress, clearly. But not only that, it's also about including improvements in housing, improvements in care, environmental enrichment, and so on. Let's keep in mind that animals, experimental animals, often spend more than 90% of their lives not having procedures performed on them. And therefore, to enrich their environment, to provide them with good quality housing during that time is incredibly important. 
So, key milestones from 1959 then coming forward to today. And as I say, I find it really amazing that there was a period of over 20 years before the, the three R's really started to pick up again in the 1980s. I actually started working for UFOR in the 1970s, soon after I graduated from vet school. And I um, found there in the bookcase a book, I found a copy of Russell and Birch's work. And I was so impressed by what I read, and I couldn't understand why these principles were not being picked up. But not until 1981 was the first Center for Alternatives developed in Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. The first World Conference on Alternatives for an and Animal Use, really highlighting the three R's, is, was in 1993, again in Baltimore. But every two to three years since then, there's been a World Congress, a WC, and WC10 will be in 2017 in Seattle. So really picked up, massively increased in size. In 2004, the National Center for the Three R's was launched in the UK. And I'm going to show you quite a bit of material in my presentation that derives from there. So you'll see their website comes up regularly in my presentation. A lot of material there for you to look at, tools for you to work with. In 2005, the European Partnership on Alternatives was developed. And there are national centers being created throughout Europe, including in Germany, Belgium, Switzerland, Netherlands and Sweden. So very much picking up since early 1980s, the concept that the three R's form this firm, solid foundation for the ethical way in which we consider about how we go about our, our research. And that came to a very significant point in 2010 when the European Directive was finalized and specifically commits to the three R's. And I think it's the only legislation at the moment in the world that commits, uh, that actually spe specifies the three R's within the requirements of the regulations. So also in 2010, the UK government made a commitment to work to reduce the use of animals in scientific research. And <clears throat> we worked hard to tease out that commitment so that it wasn't just about how can we get the numbers down as low as possible, because that's not really the right way to work. If you think about it, the more funding that goes into science, the more animals are likely to be used. And we're not very good at measuring the number of animals that don't get used because alternatives are used instead. So statistics can be very misleading in this area. So what we wanted to do was to try and make this into a science-led commitment, a science-led approach that actually covered all three R's, not just reduction. So we, we identified three priorities in that. One was about advancing the three R's, putting them at the heart of science-led programs. Domestically, that's within the UK, but also influencing global uptake um, and adoption of the three R's approaches. And finally, the third element of this, the third priority, is about promoting understanding about the use of animals where no alternatives exist. So it's important for the public to have an understanding of why animals do need to be used um, on occasions and why there are not alternatives that can just, as some would profess, that can just totally replace the use of animals entirely. Um, and you can access that publication, which is the delivery plan for delivering this piece of work, this government commitment uh, at the website that I've given there. So what does that mean for you in this room then? How can you implement the three R's in your science? And it's really important because you're all scientists in this room. You have your own type of science. And I've talked with a number of you, and what I've realized is that the, the range of science and types of procedures that you're carrying out in nutritional research is massive. And so for me to start trying to home in on particular areas of obvious nutritional research would actually potentially exclude some of the work that many of you are doing. So I'm not going to try and home in specifically on nutritional research, but give you the general principles and ask you to look very clearly at what you know about your science and how you can implement the three R's in the science that you're performing day by day. So let's look first at replacement. <clears throat> and this is one area where it's really important for you as the scientist to think about how you can use replacements. Because there are no general generalizations that can be applied to replacement. It's very specific to the particular form of science that you're doing. <clears throat> I can have people working in two adjacent laboratories 
on apparently almost the same project, but there's a subtle difference between them. They're pursuing different receptors or they're looking at different mechanisms, processes, and one replacement will work for one and not another. So it's really important that you know your science thoroughly and that you look carefully at what's going on in your scientific field and what others are using as alternatives, potential replacements for what you're doing. And obviously there's a range of replacements, biological replacements involving cell culture, non-mammalian systems, stem cell technologies. I mean, this area is just burgeoning at the moment. If you listen to the news, you'll hear stories about this all the time. And it's just massively growing, what we can do with human data, how we can grow human cells. Um, we're going to start growing human organs and things like that. So this is an absolutely amazing area of potential reward. And I would just encourage you to just keep your mind as open as possible and ensure that you're really knowing, knowing your science and looking widely. Even through high throughput spirit screening, computational mathematical models, the ability of what we can do with mathematical models is massive. So here, I've just listed them out and a range of different approaches in non-animal technologies. Um, but some of this work is quite amazing. Some of these organs on a chip that are illustrated here. This work is, that's the, that's the particular work that's being done at Harvard in Boston. And it's amazing that they can create, simulate an organ like a lung and the membrane of the lung on an, a chip like this, and it's a human lung. So there's enormous possibilities for this area, and I'm sure the same is going to apply in your field, in your specific field of science that you want to look at. What is the, the mechanism that you're exploring, and what are the opportunities for alternatives to use replacement alternatives that don't require you perhaps necessarily to go into the whole animal at such an early stage in your science. Moving on then to reduction, um, and I'm going to look at a number of different things here, but particularly reduction is, a, a lot of this is about experimental design, and it's about ensuring that the design of your experiments is as good as possible. So we all talk about well, you need to go and consult a statistician, but we don't all have access to a perfect statistician. So I want to introduce you to something that provides an alternative for you, and that's this, this system called the Experimental Design Assistant. And this has been developed by the NC3Rs in the UK, and it's taken several years for them to get to this point. The, you can see the, um, the website connection link there. Um, but what you can do here is you can try out, before you even start your experiment, you can try it out on the experimental design assistant. And it gives you a plan and takes you through step by step of your experiment. It's actually quite fun to do. But it has great benefits for you because it allows you to be able to, um, it gives you feedback on the experimental design you're proposing and it gives you advice, but it also gives you a tool that you can discuss with other people about your planned experiments. So it's more than just helping you to design your experiment, it gives you something that you can use as part of your transparency in sharing, discussing your experimental plan with your colleagues, with your collaborators, and really ensuring that you've got that design as precise and as perfect as you possibly can ahead of starting the work. So I truly do recommend this to you. It's really worth taking a look at and, and uh, having a go with this. It, recommend, it addre addresses a couple of things, which are key errors that we see, uh, particularly in animal-based research. One of those is about the importance of randomization. So through randomization, this helps to minimize selection bias, and we're all of us biased after all, aren't we? And it helps to reduce those systematic differences in the characteristics of animals when you're allocating them to treatment groups. We've all been there, haven't we? We all know what it feels like. And you really do have to do randomization. And I've got an example here that shows, this is actually some work that was done on um, studies of multiple sclerosis. And you can see very clearly that the non-randomized studies, the effect size appeared to be 42%. In the randomized studies that were explored, the effect size was only 21%. So that's a 50% difference between those two. 
What does that mean then? Well, it means your studies, when they're not randomized, are likely, highly likely, to overestimate treatment efficacy. And that could mean, um, I mean, that's bad in itself, but it could mean you make decisions or somebody makes decisions about work to proceed with, which is not really the right decision to make. And once you go past animal studies, particularly if you're in fields where you're going to be involved in clinical studies in humans or indeed in, in veterinary field, you're into big expense. So it really is worthwhile ensuring that you've done good randomization on the studies. The other one I wanted to mention is blinding. Blinding in your research strategy, that involves ensuring that the people who are conducting the experiment, who are assessing the out outcome and are analyzing the data. So this could be the people who are collecting the data in the animal facility, or it could be um, the people who are collecting the data if it's pet animals within the community that they're gathering it. They need to be unaware of the treatment allocation because they will be influenced by that. And again, if we look at the same study on multiple sclerosis, we can see that the, the non-blinded studies here affect size 41%, the blinded studies affect size only 30%. So this is a talking about accuracy. It's talking about whether you're doing good science or not. And that's where I come then to this fourth R I mentioned earlier about reproducibility. And is there a crisis in science at the moment around reproducibility? Well, I put it to you, it, even if it's not a crisis, it's a problem. And, and I've quoted here a couple of things. First of all, Amgen carried out a review of 53 preclinical cancer trials. So these are cancer trials that are carried out before the, the potential drugs went into clinical trials, okay? So these are animal-based trials. They were only able to confirm the findings in six of those 53. So that's 11% of cases, and I've given you the, the reference there. There was a nature survey, some of you may even have taken part in it, um, which was published earlier this year, of over 1,500 scientists who were questioned about reproducibility and their concern about the apparent lack of reproducibility in a lot of areas. 90% of those scientists agreed that there is a crisis, either that it was a significant crisis, which was 52%, or a slight crisis. And a lot of this was around the drive towards publication and the drive for, um, you know, publish or be damned, you've got to get your papers published. And, and they won't publish if it's a negative result, so therefore you've got to try and make it into a positive result. And so in animal work, the responsibility is even greater where animals are involved. So good experimental design is essential. Um, and it's essential not only from a scientific perspective, but also from an ethical perspective, from an economics perspective. I said earlier about you may be embarking on really expense, expensive um, clinical trials based upon the data that you've got. And from a social perspective, because if we're talking about whether it's better diets for animals or whether it's new medicines for humans, there's a social benefit out of that. And it's really important to ensure that that benefit is, being, is, is accurate. So I want to introduce you to another thing from the NC3Rs, which is their ARRIVE guidelines. And some of you may be familiar with these. Basically, the ARRIVE guidelines were drafted to give a list of, actually it ended up with 20, a checklist of 20 items which is the key information that's necessary when you're descri describing a study and to ensure that it can be both reviewed and analyzed, but also that it can be replicated, okay? And now they've been endorsed by over 600 journals internationally. So this has had a massive impact on the quality of publications and increasingly so. I've listed out the 20 here, and you can see that the middle column is about reproducibility. It's about items to describe information necessary to enable the repeating of the study. But ensuring that you've got each of these 20 items right, don't just use them at the end of the study when you want to publish. Think about the ARRIVE guidelines at the beginning and think about how you're going to address those guidelines and how you're going to provide those 20 elements at the beginning of your, before your study actually starts, because they're really important in terms of ensuring that the ultimate publication is a good quality publication. Okay, let's move on to the third R of refinement then. And uh, as I said earlier, this is not just about refining to ensure that animals 
that don't feel pain. It's about appropriate housing husbandry, minimizing stress, and so on. So housing and husbandry. Again, if you go to the NC3R site, you can find a lot of information about quality of housing, both for, in your field, probably your more interesting cats and dog housing, and they have a lot of material there on that. Housing enrichment doesn't have to be costly. I've got a picture here of a very nice piece of furniture in a cat housing. You can see that the cats are using it. Um, it's actually obtainable from a standard um, outlet. It's IKEA furniture. You can make it yourself, you can adapt it yourself, and you can create something that's interesting for the cats to play on. Likewise here, you can see a sort of manufactured tree for the cats to climb on with toys that get their attention. And you can see that that's actually enriching the environment for the cats very nicely. So it doesn't have to be costly. If we look at cat housing in 1968, and this is taken from a cat facility at Mill Hill near London in 1968, and compare it with housing now in 2016, we can see the difference that there is. And this difference is really important from the perspective of the, how the animals themselves feel about the housing. Likewise, enrichment for dogs. You can enrich dog housing by simply dividing the area that they have available to them up into different areas so they can make choices about where they want to be. You can do that in something like the housing here on, in the upper left, or this is more of a sort of toxicology type of uh, setup here. Um, but again, by giving dogs options so that they can be up on a platform looking at their, around at other dogs, or they can get down and be on a bed and be more private, they have the options of where they want to be within their environment, and they can make those choices. You can have outdoor environments such as this one. Uh, this is a, a pretty expensive arrangement that was uh, set up by AstraZeneca for their toxicology dogs in order to be able to give them outside exercise. And you can remember also that dogs like to play with toys. So here's the classic Kong. I'm sure many of you have seen this. You can put food inside it, and it'll keep the dogs occupied for a long time. You can give them access to toys like this, where water features or something that they can play with. But I think the other thing that's important from this photo is the ultimate enrichment for dogs, particularly, and that's people. And so here is a picture of my daughter with our family dog. And I know that the most important thing for him is the people around him. So make sure that your dogs are getting access to people and that they're getting that attention from people because that's one of the most important things in terms of enriching the environment for dogs. So animal welfare and quality of science are linked. I think that's a really important message. Um, Poor welfare, it's going to alter behavioral and physiological parameters. It's going to confound the ability to measure changes, whether they're being biological parameters, whatever you're investigating, they're going to be affected by um, the, the welfare of the animals. And those arise not just from the stress of pain, but also due to things like stress due to barren housing. And they're also due to the stress due, that may be due to poor handling and restraint. So continuing through the ways in which you can refine, make sure that you're handling the animals as effectively as possible. And that can be partly training people to handle animals well, but it can also be partly around training the animals to be handled well. So we know that an animal that is expecting knows what's going to happen and has an expectation of it is going to be a much more calm animal than one that is having things coming as a surprise, as a shock to it. So there's about the training of both people and training of the animals. And one of the examples around handling and restraint I like to use, which is perhaps not so immediately relevant to you, but I think has relevance in terms of the principles, is work that was done um, on laboratory mice and handling of laboratory mice. And those of you who've worked with mice are probably familiar with this as the method of, lift, of carrying and handling your mice. We were all taught to pick up the mouse by its tail and then rest it onto your cuff or your arm like that. And that's the, night, that's the right way to handle mice. Well, if you look at the results here, if you look at their voluntary interaction following that handling, it's massively lower than if you use one of two other methods of handling. 
One of those is called the tunnel method, which is where a simple plastic tube is used and the animal goes into the tunnel. And the other one is a cupping method, where the animal is simply cupped into the hands. So avoiding using this and using these two, you can see the influence of that in terms of their interaction, particularly with the tunnel method. These mice will interact and continue to interact voluntarily, um, phenomenally better than if the tail method is used. So here's a wake-up call for us about the way that we handle animals. Suddenly here we have the data that supports the fact that all through history of using mice, we've been handling mice in a way which is inherently stressful to them. So don't just take it for granted that what you're doing is necessarily best. It's good for you to be able to challenge what you do and challenge the, the way that you do it. Simple things like blood sampling. And I was talking just yesterday to some of you about taking samples from, um, from dogs uh, and so on. Well, think about the volume of blood that you need to take. Do you need, can you minimize the amount of the volume? And, and again, when we're working with very small animals, such as mice, the volume of blood is critically important. Uh, to the extent now that work has been done in toxicology studies, whereby the amount of blood that's needed for a full analysis of a sample is just a drop of blood on a piece of blotting paper, filter paper. And we can use that micro sample to be able to get all of the values that we need to have out of a sample. So think about learning from some of those kinds of techniques. You may not want to get right down to micro sampling, but if you've only got the tail of a mouse available to you and you need to use that mouse, what it means is you can use the mouse as its own control, you use fewer animals because you're able to take serial blood samples from them and so on. And it really changes. The, it's a, an amazing reduction as well as refinement practice. Um, how do we recognize? pain, suffering, and distress so that we can prevent it? What do we know about how our animals tell us whether they're in pain, whether they're suffering, whether they're distressed? Many species, including the ones we think we're familiar with, will hide those things because that's also in their nature, to hide the fact that they're in pain or distress. Particularly species that are um, prey species to predators, they will tend to hide it and not make it obvious. So again, we've looked at what we call grimace scales in animals. So this is looking here, mice, rats, and, and rabbits, and looking at the facial expressions that go with different degrees of pain or discomfort. Now, I haven't seen the same work done on companion animals, but I think it would be quite interesting to start looking more carefully at some of these indicators. Because with some of these scales here, I talk to animal technicians who've been handling rats, for example, all their lives. And when they see this, they say, wow, I've been seeing that in rats all through my career, but I never realized that that was a sign that they're in pain or that they're in distress. So it's really important for us to think about how is the animal expressing it and how is it hiding what it's actually sensing. Okay, so then we're moving forward then to um, what's happening internationally. And I just want to talk a little bit about this, how we're influencing the global uptake and adoption of the three R's approaches on an international basis. So first thing is to look again, at how do people feel about animals in other parts of the world? And so we kind of took a little bit of rain check on this. And of course, we look at who are the key influences in this. And I, I think this is a great quote from Gandhi. The greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. And it really reflects that same utilitarian approach about minimizing harms and maximizing benefits. Now, we tend to think of certain countries as not having care for animals, particularly where humans may be suffering significantly as well. Well, I can tell you that's not necessarily the case. And the work that I've been doing has really been a bit of an eye-opener in many countries about how much people do care about animals and how much they do care about ensuring that their science is good and that their animal care is also good. So if we look at animals in different world religions as a way of measuring what cultures think about, you can see that all of these religions feature a real reverence for animal life. And it requires us, for example, to treat animals kindly and respectfully, to experiment on animals only where there is no alternative, and we, that's replacement, 
to design experiments to do as little harm as possible, which is reduction and refinement, to avoid killing unless it's absolutely necessary, and to experiment only for a good purpose. And that's kind of the harm-benefit analysis piece that we get there. So this actually comes from different cultures and different religions around the world. So clearly, for our international partners, if you want to achieve something, it's always good to start off by thinking, what are the benefits? Um, if you've ever worked in sales, you'll know that you mustn't talk about the features, you talk about the benefits, or at least you have to convert the features of your wonderful product into benefits. That's what we all, as purchasers of items, want to think about. What's the benefit of something? And so we want to think about what are the benefits of, of implementing the three R's um, uh, more internationally. So there's ethical benefits, clearly. Um, eliminating duplication, unnecessary, particularly safety testing, it minimizes animal use, and it also speeds up market approval so we can get those new medicines, new cosmetics, better animal um, feed stuffs, and so on like that, into the market, and people can benefit from those. But it also raises awareness of the three R's, and it improves public confidence in the use of animals in research, and that's really important, because even, I, I find in countries like China, there is a significant public concern about use of animals in research. Um, quite surprisingly, uh, because I initially, in my ignorance, understood that that was not a concern. But it's a growing concern, and it comes with increasing urbanization, which we were learning about earlier this morning as well. But it's not just about ethical benefits. It's also about economic and social benefits. So we're removing barriers for international trade, for example, with medicines and cosmetics. And for example, I've given there, the value of the market for medicines and cosmetics with China is about 1 point, uh, 125 billion per annum. So these are massive markets. And we're also increasing market options for consumers, which is socially very important. And then finally, but not least, are the scientific benefits. Because the more compatible our standards of the way that we work, the way that we care for animals, the principles that we work with, the more those are compatible and shared, the more we're able to collaborate with scientists. Scientists from different countries can collaborate when they're using animals as part of their research. So there's real scientific benefits in achieving this. And again, for a country like China, China is graduating phenomenal numbers of PhD graduates, postdocs, and so on every year far more than the rest of the world pretty well put together. So where is the future of science going to be? We're, we're all of us working with Chinese colleagues around us. We need to know that this is where the future is, and therefore it's really important for any country to be working with other countries and finding ways to have a compatibility and a comfortable way of doing that. So I've given here the example, one example of our UK-China partnership. Um, we've been funding that, the UK government's been funding this for three years. Um, the common theme is around promoting the three R's, as I've talked about. It was actually particularly boosted last year when President Xi came to visit the UK. And that was an example where it's really important having high governmental, high level within government support for these projects. So having the ability to be able to get the Prime Minister um, or the president here in the US or whatever it would be, getting people at high level to include these kind of issues in their dialogues is really important and really impactful. We have three overall aims of this project. One of them is around cosmetics, where we're aiming to eliminate unnecessary animal testing. At the moment, China mandates animal testing of imported cosmetics, and we're working with them to move away from that. Pharmaceuticals, we're looking to, we're taking China towards becoming part of the OECD system for mutual acceptance of data, and that will avoid unnecessary duplication of testing. And on the broader animal welfare front of research animal welfare, China earlier this year at a seminar that we were running in China announced a commitment to, during this current political period, um, of five years, it's going to commit, it's committed to new regulations and standards, which are going to explicitly mention 
welfare, and the three R's. So those three projects over a two to three year period have made massive progress, and it's through working with our Chinese colleagues, building relationships, and ensuring that we're sharing issues with them, sharing pro their problems, and finding solutions with them to how they can implement these things, rather than forcing our standards on them. It's about learning together uh, and being able to do that. We've been working in Brazil slightly less time. It's not such a big investment here, but we have a memorandum of understanding that was signed last year, and it's committed to promoting scientific collaborations between the UK and Brazil, and putting the three R's at the heart of the, that science-led strategy of collaborations. So we've got some money going into a Brazil prosperity fund, but it's about developing equal partnership in scientific collaborations. And the overall aims there are again around animal welfare, so helping Brazilian scientists and veterinarians to think about ethical review in the research process of, of research project proposals and think about how do you apply the three R's in proposals to ensure that you are applying good judgment in your ethical review. And also on cosmetics, it's a slightly different project because Brazil does not want to conduct um, animal tests, but doesn't yet have the technology to enable it to conduct the non-animal tests that have been validated by OECD. Third one here, very briefly, is an Israeli partnership that we have. This is a smaller one again. Um, and this is really about running shared seminars to promote the three R's between scientists in the two countries. And providing, by, by providing these seminars, and the first one we're going to be running is on models in neuroscience, is about taking the opportunity of having scientists traveling between the two countries to give masterclasses in promoting the three R's in the two countries. I know some of you are a little concerned about the three R's and regulatory testing. So I wanted very briefly just to cover this. Um, and I think one of the first things to bear in mind is that regulators are naturally conservative. And they will seek evidence through validation of any test. So if you want to provide a non-animal test as an alternative to an animal test, you will have to validate it and then some because regulators are always going to be conservative. No regulator gets praised for accepting an alternative, but they do get blamed when they make the wrong decision. So you need to understand that and work with regulators along those lines. Consider alternatives as expanding your toolbox. Don't necessarily think of an alternative as one that will take away an animal test immediately. It may be that you just use it initially to expand your toolbox, your tools to get information and gradually over time, the animal test will prove itself no longer to be needed. So that's one approach you can take. There's no doubt at all that increasing international collaboration encourages faster adoption. Regulators also like to um, hunt in packs, is it, or something like that. Anyway, they like to think um, commonly, so they don't want to be the first one to go forward. So if you can get international collaboration, and I've given some examples, of different ways in which international collaboration, councils on harmonization for medicines and veterinary medicines, um, OECD test guidelines are classic ways of validating tests that then lead to mutual acceptance of data. I've mentioned a vaccine initiative there which is looking at the, the, the vaccine testing and persuading adoption on existing vaccines whilst at the same time moving towards new vaccines, whether they're human or medical or veterinary vaccines, not requiring animal testing. And finally, remember to differentiate between verif verification and validation. Validation is the technical proof that you validated a test that it is as good, if not better, than the animal-based test. Verification is about verifying that you can conduct that test in your laboratory. And it's very important to make sure that people don't start going all the way back to square one when they're doing just verification, really. So coming back to the beginning and 18, well, not quite the beginning, but 1876, I really like when I found this quote from Charles Darwin, um, where he had obviously got very involved in the discussions around um, the new legislation in 1876 helped to set the tone for how research would be regulated. And he said, I worked all the time in London on the vivisection question. The object is to protect animals and at the same time not to injure physiology. So that, in my view, translates to a model 
that we've been using um, for about the last five or six years, and I think it very nicely illustrates how to make decisions about what science should or shouldn't go ahead and why it should, and, and the, the sort of judgments, the way in which you get that balance right. So clearly it's important that we enable quality science, that we ensure that through whatever the regulatory system may be, that quality science is allowed to be conducted, that the benefits from scientific knowledge and understanding and those brains of scientists, your brains, can go ahead and be enabled to carry out quality science. But at the same time, it's important that the system of regulation, controls, your own controls, are safeguarding animal welfare. So you can apply that balance in your own mind in terms of what you think is right or wrong to conduct. And it's through that balance of those two factors we promote public confidence. So if science becomes overwhelming and animal welfare is abandoned, the public will lose confidence. If, on the other hand, the animal welfare becomes the overwhelming factor and science is therefore blocked, hindered, again, the public will lose confidence because the public is not getting the benefit of that science. And I think it's really important to think through this balance and ensure that we get that right. Thank you very much.